What I'd like to do now is pick up where we left off. Because folks, there are a whole lot of folks who are like me. And there might be some, if you're our guest here right now, from another, let's say you're Baptist. I think there's more Baptists than people in South Carolina. Isn't that true? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, I was raised Southern Baptist. We used to joke, you know, there's more Baptist denominations than there are Baptists. But anyway, uh, I got that from a Baptist preacher, by the way, so I'm not picking on anybody. But anyway, uh, a lot might be saying, hey, you know what? I agree with everything you said, man. That was good stuff. My problem is, what about that Catholic church? That's my problem. Well, this one's for you. What we want to do is pick up where we left off, and we... We've seen that we can demonstrate that God exists. We have a spiritual nature. We have an immortal soul. We are ordered toward knowing and loving God, which points us toward the idea of natural law and natural religion. But remember, we confronted a problem, and that is God is infinite and we're not. So in order for us to reach God, God needs to reach us. Amen? And that introduced the idea of the necessity of revelation. But the question we asked is, has God revealed himself? And the answer is definitively yes. And we can know it in the historic person, Jesus Christ, who really did live, really did die, and is resurrected from the dead. And this is demonstrated by over 500 eyewitnesses, as St. Paul re records in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 has been demonstrated through the miracles of Christ that are attested to not only by believers, but by unbelievers. For example, the Jews who said, remember in Matthew chapter 12, he did this by the power of the devil. They didn't deny that he did the miracles. Why? Because everybody there saw him. They couldn't do that. And by the way, the Talmuds continued into the 6th century never denying the miracles of Christ, but claiming he was a sorcerer. And he did it through the use of sorcery. But the problem with that is, folks, the devil can't perform miracles. Did y'all know that? He can do tricks, but he doesn't have the power to perform a true miracle that requires infinite power. Now, what do I mean by that? The devil can do all kinds of tricks, right? I mean, my goodness, if David Copperfield can make you and I go, hmm, what could the devil do? We see in the book of Exodus, the, the, uh, the, the magicians of Pharaoh who produce snakes from sticks. Of course, God won up, up some through Moses, but they were doing sleight of hand. Moses was doing miracles. How do you know the difference? Well, you know the difference because true miracles require infinite power. And what do I mean by that? True miracles involve what's called substantial change. And I'll use the example from Lourdes. There's a, a famous miracle. What was her name? Uh, oh. There was a famous miracle where a woman had lupus and part of her skin was eaten away. They called it lupus back then. She had caverns in her face where there were no skin. She was touched by the water at Lourdes, and she got brand new skin, pink, like a baby. Guess what? The devil can't do that. You know why? Because the devil doesn't have the power to create. In order to create, you have to bring something from nothing. Didn't we learn about that? That requires infinite power. Now, we didn't get a chance to go any deeper on that, but think about this, folks. If I had, here's a simple way to remember this. If I had two piles of materials picture this in your mind one pile now these are all the materials necessary for a house in one pile i have nothing but wood and stone and drywall and glass and such all laid out in a big pile and in the other pile i i have more than a pile we have a foundation laid the walls are already put up right we've got some windows in there and such the wiring hadn't been put in yet. Which one of those houses would require more power to complete? The first, where there's no foundation, no walls. Or the second, 
that's partially built. Which would require more power, more energy to complete? Well, of course, the first one, right? The one that's nothing but a pile of materials. It requires more power. Why? Because there's more potential and less actuality there. I just spit on you, I think, there, Todd. <laughs> right? There's more potency and less act. Therefore, it requires more power to reduce that potency to act than this other house. Well, let's go to a third house. And all we have is nothing. And I mean absolutely nothing. I mean, we don't even have dirt. <laughs> Amen. You've heard the joke, right? <laughs> Where... You know, God says to the scientist who says, we, we don't need you, God, right? And we can, we can create all sorts of things. We can make glass. We can create plastic from this or that. He says, we can take the dirt. And what does God say? Get your own dirt. Okay? <laughs> How much power is required to bring that house into existence from absolutely nothing? Infinite power. Why? Because there's infinite potency and no actuality. See, the devil cannot raise the dead. That requires infinite power. The devil cannot perform a miracle that requires substantial change. See, that's why Jesus demonstrated who he was through his miracles, as well as the fulfillment of all of the prophecies, scores of prophecies from the Old Testament. He fulfilled, you know, where he would be born, right? Micah chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. Roughly the time in Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 9 that he would come into this world. What tribe he would be from. Uh, Genesis chapter 49 uh, verse 10. Describes his crucifixion hundreds of years before crucifixion even existed. In wisdom chapter 2 and Psalm 22. Describe his suffering to a T in Isaiah chapter 53. And we could go on and on. The, the prophecies that are fulfilled in Christ. So the fact is, folks, we have Jesus Christ, and all Christians agree, this is reasonable, this is demonstrable, that Jesus fulfilled these texts. He performed miracles to prove he was who he says he was. But now we've got to take the next step. And the next step is this. Here's the way I like to start it. If I were to say to all my Protestant friends, if you're here right now, and you're a Baptist, a Pentecostal, or like I used to call myself, a Bapticostal. <laughs> I was raised Baptist and became a Pentecostal. Uh, we would all agree on this. And that is, in the Gospels, what we see revealed is that Jesus Christ is God, and all authority in heaven and on earth resides in Him. Amen? In fact, the scriptures are so clear on this. Jesus was so clear. He said, for example, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. That Greek word for authority is exousia, which means literally in Greek, out of the substance. Right? All authority in heaven is given me. Think about how many different ways Jesus said this. That all authority was given to him by the Father. If you go to Luke chapter 22, verse 29, for example. Jesus says, as the Father has committed a kingdom unto me. Right? All authority. A kingdom has given to him. Or think about this. In John 17, 8, he says to the Father, he says, your words... You have given to me. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because he is the word. Amen? Yet he says, Father, your words you have given to me. How about, how about another one? We could do this all day. How about another one? John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me. Right? Now, I'm going to pause here for a moment. Because there's two key words here. Sent, number one. Uh, the Greek verb is apostello. Does that sound familiar? It's where the word, the noun is apostolos, right? Apostle. Sent. That's the, now you also find pimpo for, for sent, but this is apostello, right? Uh, and also, 
John chapter 5, verse 43. Jesus says that I am come in my Father's name. Right? Now the problem is, and I could multiply these texts. We lose this a little bit in the translation in the modern era. When Jesus says that the Father sent me, you know, you and I say, oh, whoop-de-doo, okay, sent. But sent doesn't mean, apostello doesn't mean like to send a letter. You would normally use pimpo for that. Apostello means you are sent with the authority of the one who sent you. It's really important. Apostello, right? And when we talk about in the name, when he says, I am come in my Father's name, in toanamity in, in Greek, in the name of, uh, you know, maybe we miss it today because of all of the denominations we have. You know, everybody stands up and says, I'm speaking in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And it's, me, it, it's become meaningless to a popular audience because if everybody speaks in the name of Jesus, nobody speaks in the name of Jesus, right? It's lost its meaning. See, in the name of in the New Testament and since in the New Testament means you are speaking with the authority of. Kind of like when I was a military policeman, when I was in the Marine Corps, I remember working crowd control in El Toro in, in Southern California when I was an MP and we had an air show. The Marine Corps Air Show, you know, the Blue Angels came in, and awesome, right? Well, we have a very small police force at, as in the Marines. And I remember thinking, when we're working crowd control, and there's like a half a million people. It was outrageous. There's people ever. I remember thinking, man, if these people rebelled on us, what in the world? We, we'd run out of ammunition, right? I mean, shooting all these people. <laughs> Hey, forgive me, I'm a Marine, okay? That's the way we think. But anyway, the point is, though, I remember when me and my partner picked up a couple of kids because they were doing some things you ain't supposed to be doing. And I remember we kind of went around both sides and we surprised them and, and, and we got them. But I remember, you know, now I didn't use this language, but if I said stop in the name of the law, right, what does that mean? What that means is, Stop, not because I'm standing here, but because this badge I'm wearing represents a whole lot of Marines that are bigger and badder than you. And whatever weapons you have, we have bigger ones. All right? In other words, in the name of the law means I'm representing something a lot bigger than me, and so you better think twice. In the name of. See, when Jesus said, I come in the name of my Father... These are important words with the authority of the Father. When he says, as the Father has sent me, the word apostello means sent with the authority of the one who sent him. This is why Jesus could say, if you hear me, you hear the Father. If you reject me, you reject the Father in Luke chapter 10, verse 16, and in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. Now, folks, Every Christian in here, and who may be watching this or listening to this, agrees. Yes, all authority is given to Jesus Christ, I believe. But here is the elephant in the middle of the room. All right? You remember the story of, of uh, police officers who arrive on the scene of a murder? And they go in, you know, they tape everything off, and there's a guy laying in the middle of a room, and he's been literally crushed. I mean, this, is, this, this was on television not long ago. That's a joke, Tyler. Anyway, guy's laying in the middle of the floor. He's, guy's laying in the middle of the floor. He's been flattened, literally, just crushed. There's blood everywhere. It's a horrible scene. And so, they, you know, they tape it off, and, they're, and, and the, the police officers are in there, and they're dusting for prints, and they're trying to find any kind of evidence. Who could have done this? And every time, you know, as they're walking around the room, they keep, they keep running into this elephant right in the middle of the room. And it's making their police work hard. So they're, and they're dusting over here. And finally, one of them says, well, somebody get this elephant out of the middle of this room. It's in our way. And by the way, they never found the killer. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little joke, yes. <clears throat> By the way, Tyler, that means the elephant squashed the guy. All right, anyway. The <laughs> point is, here is the elephant in the middle of the room that I missed and my Protestant friends miss 
when it gets this. Because every one of these examples that I just gave you of Jesus declaring that all authority is given to him. He was sent by the Father. He comes in the name of the Father. And you'll find in the New Testament virtually every example of him doing that in the same breath. Sometimes in the same sentence, but always in the same context, he then says, I am committing my authority to the church. This is the elephant in the middle of the room, folks. Think about it. Let's go back to Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven has given me. What does he say in the next breath? Go, therefore, teach all nations, right? Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe and do according to all that I have commanded. What does he say in Luke twenty two twenty nine? As the Father has committed a kingdom to me, what's the next breath? So I commit my kingdom unto you, and I will establish you as twelve rulers to sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Right? What about John twenty? As the Father has sent me, what's the next breath? So have I sent you. And he breathed on them again and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose service sends you forgive their forgiven. Whose service sends you retain their retain. We're going to come back to that verse in a moment. Right? There he communicates his authority to the apostles. In fact, in John 17, as the Father, he says, Your words you have given to me, I have given my words to, or your words to them, and they have received them. Amen? See, this is the communication of authority to the church. So much so that, remember I quoted Matthew 10, 40 and Luke uh, chapter 10, verse 16, where Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, right? So do I send you? Well, listen to this. He says, if they hear you, they hear me. If they reject me, they reject the Father. Now, last time I only quoted the part about Jesus saying, if you reject me, you reject the Father. But you know what else he said? He said to the church, the apostles, if they hear you, they hear me. If they reject you, they reject me. Folks, we could go down a litany of texts, but I need to add this too, because there's another thing that I discovered. Not only... Does Jesus make it very clear that he communicates? And I want you to take this home with you. He communicates a threefold office. It's kind of a, a triune office that consists of three offices. Are you following me? And, and accompanying or concurrently with communicating that triune office, if you will, it's almost a, a Trinitarian commission that the Father gives the Son. He communicates that same triune office and triune emphasis or mission to the apostles. What do I mean by that? Baltimore Catechism. Y'all ready? Told us a long time ago, us Catholics, before any of us were born, that Jesus was given uh, three offices by the Father. And they're really one. He was sent to be what? Prophet, priest, and king. Amen? Prophet. He was sent to declare the word of God. What does prophecy mean? To literally speak forth. That's what prophecy means. To speak forth the mind of God. He is prophet who, and by the way, folks, he declares the word of God infallibly. Amen? Amen. Remember I quoted John 5, 43, where Jesus says, I am come in my Father's name. In the next line, he says, if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Isn't that something? I am come in my Father's name. If another comes in his own, own name, what's he talking about? What he's talking about is that he speaks in the Father's name. That means by the authority of the Father. And if you disagree with me, you are disagreeing with the Marine Corps. Oh, no, excuse me. You are disagreeing with the Father. Amen? Why? Because I'm come in the name of my Father. That means definitive authority. Not an opinion. Amen? Now keep that in mind because we're going to come back to it. In the name of. Well, folks, what does he send the church to do? To speak in the name of. Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Alright, think about this. So he is sent to... 
prophesy. He is prophet, right? He's also sent as priest. Why? To sanctify through, of course, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, through the forgiveness of sins. Jesus came, and what did he do in Mark chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 9? Remember with the paralytic? He said, thy sins are forgiven thee. <gasps> Who is this man to forgive sins? Amen? See? He is priest in that he forgives sins. Prophet, priest, and king. Now, I want you to, to, to take this home with you. You're going to take a lot home with you. Have you ever noticed how when Jesus then commissions the church, he commissions the church with the same triune office. Now, I know the Baltimore Catechism talks about the three offices of Christ, of prophet, priest, and king. But actually, those three offices are triune. They're one. You can't separate them, right? You can make reasonable distinctions, but you can't separate them, all right? That's why I say they're triune. And the concurrent triune mission that goes with them. Jesus communicates the same three offices, that triune office, and the same three missions to the church. And you ever notice how in Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Mark tend to emphasize the prophetic. Say, why, Tim? What did we just read in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20? All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Go ye therefore and do what? Teach. Amen? He says, teach all nations. Did y'all know that Mark is the Franciscan gospel? Yeah. Mark is the Franciscan gospel. The reason why I say that is because Matthew emphasizes the teaching, the prophetic office of Jesus, when it says, go and teach all nations. But do you ever notice how in Mark, in Mark 16, 15, it says, Jesus said, go and teach every creature. Amen? <laughs> Somebody got it. Somebody got it. Okay. St. Francis and, and St. Anthony took that a little bit literal right there, right? Preaching to the fish and to the, you know. But anyway, in Mark and in Matthew, Jesus says, all authority is given me. Go teach all nations. Teach every creature. Or actually, in, in Mark, it says, preach the gospel to every creature. So Matthew and Mark emphasize the preaching, the prophetic. What does Luke emphasize? In Luke 22, 29, didn't we just say it? As the Father has committed a kingdom. Are you all awake? <laughs> kingdom unto me. So I commit my kingdom and I will establish you as 12 what? Rulers. Does that sound like judging? Right? Judging. Yes. I will, you know, establish you as 12 rulers sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He emphasizes the ruling aspect, the kingship. And what does John emphasize? The sanctification. Amen? As the Father has sent me, John chapter 20, so do I send you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus has all authority. It, you know, in the three offices that the Father communicated to him and the three missions that are concurrent with it. He then communicates that to the apostles, to the church. Now, some of my brothers and friends will say, hey, man, I agree with that too. But it was only given to the apostles, not to the church per se. What do you say to that? Au contraire. Au contraire. And why do you say that? Because let's go to Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. My friends... This should be the Catholic John 3.16. Every Catholic should memorize, should know. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Why? Because Jesus Christ, in the context of communicating his authority to the apostles, does not limit that authority to the apostles of 2,000 years ago. You say, prove it. Here we go. In Matthew 18.15. It says, if your brother shall offend against thee, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. If he will not hear you, take two or three witnesses with you, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he will not hear them, tell it to the Bible. Ah, <laughs> oh, I tried to sneak one over on you. Is that what Jesus said? No, he said, tell it 
to the ecclesia, the church. And the one who fails to hear the church is to be as a heathen and a publican. By the way, that's not Republican, that's publican. (laughs) Now, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm a Republican. I better get out of this one right now. Anyway, Bias is a heathen and a publican. For whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is the communication of his authority. And not only to 12 apostles 2,000 years ago, but to the church. So that in all generations, as the catechism of the Catholic Church makes very clear, Matthew will complete this thought in Matthew 28. He says, all authority in heaven and earth is given me. Go ye therefore. Teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lo, I will be with you all days. All days, even until the end of the age. Not just in the first century, amen, but till the end of time, the true church must have apostolic authority according to Jesus. So that in, I always use this with my Mormon friends. Because what's interesting about Mormonism is that Mormons will agree with us. As you know, Father, Father studied with uh, Mormons many years ago. And you know that Mormons will say, hey, I don't believe in sola scriptura, the Bible alone. Yeah, we believe there has to be an authoritative church. And I'll go with my Mormon friends. to. And by the way, in my book, Nuts and Bolts, if you pick up my book, I give you a chapter where I I go through an actual experience I had, and it's been duplicated many times over the years with many Mormons. Uh, But I'll go with them to Matthew 18, and I'll quote it to them, and they say, Amen! Absolutely! If we have, if your brother offends against thee, and by the way, there's no greater offense that we could have between us than you accusing me of heresy or me accusing you of heresy. Amen, Tyler? Because, I, you know, in a certain sense, folks, and I know we've lost this sensibility in the modern era, but heresy is a more dangerous sin than murder. You know why? Because murder kills bodies. Heresy kills souls. We're talking about eternal salvation when we talk about heresy. Jesus tells us, this is how you settle it. I t- say this to my Mormon friends all the time. I say, brother, so you and I agree. That if we can't agree or two Mormon elders can't agree, what do they do? They take it to the church and say, amen, we follow Jesus. And I say, great. Isn't it great to know that we have the word of God and we both agree the Bible's the word of God? Now, I know you've got some more books, three more. Pearl of Great Price, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants. All right, we'll deal with that later. But we both believe the Bible is the word of God. Amen. So we can pick it up and know this is Jesus speaking to us, man. And it's right on. And they say, amen. And then I say, well... I do my Columbo per impersonation. You know? <laughs> now the younger people don't know who Columbo is here, but <laughs> Columbo was a detective that was famous for. He would scratch his head and say, I, "Can I ask you one more question?" <laughs> and you play kind of dumb. You say, "Well, well, can I ask you one more question? One more question. Where do you go? Let's say we're in the colonies in the United States of America, the new colonies. Let's say you know it's 1790." And we're all excited because we find this Bible and we say, wow, me and Tyler don't agree. But Jesus said we can go to the church. So where do I go in 1790? And I get silence. And you know why? Because Joseph Smith Smith and Brigham Young said all the Christian churches fell away. And their creeds are abominations. There was no church on the planet for 1800 years. Well, then Jesus is a liar. Because he told me, amen, I can go to the church. I remember, my wife will tell you, I had a young Mormon boy on an airplane one time. He was an elder, just returning home after his two-year mission, and we had him in tears. I didn't mean to. <laughs> I really didn't. I didn't mean to, but he did. He, he brought, And we, we talked about eternal marriage also, and uh, we don't have time to do that right now. But both times, he, he didn't have an answer. I later got a a letter in the mail because I gave him my information. I got a letter from his mother. His mother just reamed me of, how dare you? You have hurt my son's faith. How dare you? And I'm thinking to myself, he's just been going around for two years hurting people's faith. 
you know, trying to turn people into Mormons. So I, I don't understand that. But anyway, here's the point. The point is that until the end of time, Jesus guarantees that if me and Tyler disagree about the Bible, we have an answer. And it doesn't come from the Bible in the final sense. Not according to Jesus. Jesus didn't say tell it to the Bible. He said tell it to the church. And this should be obvious to us, my friends, because Jesus is too smart to establish his church upon a book. <laughs> Amen? Does anybody agree Jesus was pretty smart? <laughs> he, he's not dumb enough to establish his church upon a book because a book can be interpreted in thousands of ways and certainly over thousands of years. That's, what, not, that's not what Jesus did. He gave us a church. And my friends, that church has infallible authority. If Jesus Christ was infallible, then the church is infallible. If you're not going to a church that claims to be infallible, and what I mean by infallible, my friends, it doesn't mean without sin. Amen? Amen. So many people confuse infallibility with impeccability. The popes are not impeccable. Amen? We've had some choice popes. You know, we could talk about Alexander VI, who had six kids. And by the way, that means outside of wedlock, okay? <laughs> and I don't even want to talk about the Borgia Popes and the... Uh, yes. Anyway, the point is, Jesus didn't build his church upon a book, and he also didn't build his church upon an individual or individuals. But he built his church upon Peter and the apostles and their successors who are guaranteed infallible authority by Jesus... It's Jesus powered, not theirs, so that Peter could deny Jesus three times, but we don't reject first and second Peter as a result. Amen? Because Jesus guaranteed to communicate his truth through his church. And that church, as a matter of history, has been the Catholic Church. In fact, you can go to the Encyclopedia Britannica and look up Catholic Church. And you know what you're going to find? By the way, the Encyclopedia Britannica is not a Catholic book. But it's the only encyclopedia in the United States that is able to be introduced in a court of law as evidence. Did you know that? It's the only encyclopedia that's allowed is the Encyclopedia Britannica. And it says of the Catholic Church, the church established by Jesus Christ in 33 AD. Not because they're Catholic, but because that is an historical fact, my friends. And we can back that up biblically as well as historically. But you know, I'm going to change gears here because we want to be sure that we can uh, take some questions. But I, I want to move forward because let, let me and I'm going to use my own experience here. Because like I said, my Protestant friends, I know that I was raised with and ministered with. Many of them are now Catholic. Uh but they'll agree, and they'll say, man, I'm with you all the way. I would even like there to be an infallible church where we could get a sure word from God when we disagree on matters of faith and morals, let's say on the Trinity or salvation or justification. I would love to be able, but I just don't buy it because I don't see it in the Catholic Church because what I see in Catholicism are so many beliefs that are radically contradictory to Jesus Christ, that I can't. Tim, I'd like to believe it, but I can't. And this is why. All right. They will throw out things. And believe me, folks, I was there. And this is why I'm, I'm screaming at you right now. Not screaming, but I do get a little loud. To take seriously your Catholic faith more so tomorrow than you did yesterday. Because you and I need to be able to sit down with folks like me 24, 25 years ago when I thought you guys were so nuts because you taught things. And even when I began to make sense of certain things about Catholicism, I said, but there's so many issues. You ever heard that line from Song of Solomon? It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Right? You know what that means. You get enough little foxes in your vineyard and when they do their thing in there, They'll eventually spoil the vine. And a lot of times it's the little issues. It's little things. A lot of times I find it's personal hurt. People have been wounded and hurt decades before. But you know what? What I see is a common, a common denominator here. And I'm going to give you an example. 
The common denominator is you and I need to sit down and talk about it with these folks. Because whether they've been wounded, they've been hurt many years from God only knows many years ago. And I'm going to give you one example. I was on the phone with a woman who, oh my, she called in the radio show and she was mad. And she, I don't even remember the issue anymore, but she went off on me and said, rah, 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 right? And so I answered I calmly. I said, well, let me respond. And boom, 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 boom. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, this is going to go too long on the air. Leave your phone number with our call screener and I will call you when I get off the air. And so I did. We ended up talking for like an hour and a half, two hours. And man, we're going down the list. Calling priests, fathers, statues, praying to dead folks, you name it. And I answer them, and I answer them, and I answer them. And you know what happened? We're an hour and a half into the conversation, and she breaks down and starts crying. And you know what she said to me? Blurted out. But my mother abused me. And I'm like, whoa. She was abused horribly by her mother, who obviously had deep problems, but dragged her to church every Sunday sometimes by the hair, and said, you're going to sit there. She transposed Catholicism onto the abuse she got from her mother. And she opened up and cried and wept. And you know what, though, folks? Here's the point I'm making. We would have never got to the real issue unless we answered those little things. A lot of times, folks, I find that the facade... Are all of those little things. Not all the time. But a lot of times this is part of a facade. And the person doesn't even realize it. You know the human person is a mystery. We don't understand our own hearts. Amen. Much less anybody else's. But a lot of times people are speaking out of pain. Some of them are pastors of churches. They've left the Catholic faith. And they're anti-Catholic and they're venomous. But they're speaking out of pain. And some of them don't even know the, the, the full brunt of it until you and I sit down and we begin to share. It just happened to me again a few months ago. I was at lunch with a pastor, a Protestant minister. Who's a, he's not only a pastor, but he's a professor at two Baptist universities. And we were at lunch. He broke into tears. But this wasn't because of any abuse. This was because we've been talking for a long, long time. And you know what he said to me? We were talking about the Blessed Mother. He put his hands in his, up to his head and he started crying. And he said, my God, Tim, this stuff is true. What am I going to do? He has three kids. All of his income is wrapped up in the Baptist church. But you know what? He's coming into church this Easter. God bless him. The guy is unbelievably strong. I've sent him to Marcus Grodi in the Coming Home, Net, Home Network, and we're going to do it. My wife and I just had dinner with him and some others recently. But folks, I, I, I say all that to say this. Whatever the motive, whatever is going on inside of the hearts of people, you and I as Catholics must take our obligation serious. And I say obligation because the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us in paragraph 900 that each one of us has the right and the duty to evangelize, either individually or grouped together in associations. Did you know that? We have the right and the obligation to evangelize. It's time that we stop keeping this stuff to ourselves and get out and tell somebody about it. But I will guarantee you there are millions like I was who, like I said, even appreciate a lot of the things that you and I have been talking about. But you know what they're hung up on? Calling priest father. And those of you who, who have, you know that I'm right. Because I, I, I have debated world-renowned ministers who are hung up on call no man father. Do you know what that means? We need to get the answer. What do you do when somebody says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 9, as I did to so many Catholics for so many years, Jesus said, call no man on this earth father for you. I have one father which is in heaven. Now, folks, we've got to understand. That sounds pretty plain, doesn't it? Call no man on this earth father. I remember saying to Catholics years ago, what part of no don't you understand? 
<laughs> Wasn't there a country song? <laughs> what part of no? That's exactly what I was saying to y'all. What part of no don't you understand? But you know what happened to me? The reason why I'm standing here Catholic today, and not only me, but my father, my mother, my three brothers, two sisters-in-law, and literally thousands of people around the world, by God's grace, through me and through my, my priestly brother. I mean, it's unbelievable. This is proof positive that God can use knuckleheads when he uses me and my brother. You know, I have to call my brother Father Knucklehead now, you know? <laughs> but anyway, the point is, call him a father. The reason why I'm standing here as a Catholic is because a young Marine stood up to me and said, Tim, let me give you the Catholic response. And I'm like, yeah, have at it. How are you going to respond to that? You know what he said to me? He said, Tim, did you know there's more than one verse in the Bible? <laughs> he did. <laughs> By the way, y'all get my CD set, Jimmy Swaggart made me Catholic. All right? You got to get a hold of it. Because I tell you the whole story, and I go through a whole lot of verses of Scripture. But we're just going to have time to do a few here. But you know what he said? There's more than one verse. You know, I'm like, of course there's more than one verse. You're getting me mad. Yes, sir, I know there's more than one verse of the Bible. And, and you know what he said? He said, Tim, look. Man, even in human discourse, y'all know. I mean, if, if I were to say to Tyler right now, man, I've been picking on you all day. If I were to say to Tyler right now, put the kitty on the table. Right? What would you say to me? Put the kitty on the table. Tyler's looking at me like I'm crazy. And rightfully so, because it has no meaning. Put the kitty on. What are you talking about? But Tyler, what if we were in a pet store? <sighs> Immediately, what just happened? Y'all got the idea, didn't you, of a four-legged creature with whiskers and fur that ought to be exterminated. Am I right? <laughs> right? Oh, I'm sorry. That No, no, no. That last part, forget about that. Anyway. <laughs> I just lost all the women right now. So. He is so mean. Anyway, I'm kidding with you. Anyway, kind of. Anyway, here's <laughs> immediately when I said pet store, now kitty has a particular meaning. But what if we were at a poker game? All of a sudden, the same words. Put the kitty on the table. Have an entirely different meaning. Why? Not because of the words, but because of the context. See, I'm kidding with you. Anyway, kind of. Anyway, here's... <laughs> Immediately when I said pet store, now kitty has a particular meaning. But what if we were at a poker game? All of a sudden, the same words... Put the kitty on the table. Have an entirely different meaning. Why? Not because of the words, but because of the context. See, you Catholics are so... Can I say this, y'all? You're a bunch of spoiled, rotten brats. Did y'all know that? <laughs> you are! And now I'm one of you. I'm a spoiled, rotten brat. But we are. We have this deposit of faith. We have the magisterium that is so rich and so full. And we sit back... And don't take advantage of it. You know, oh sure, I've got the faith. I know it's true. And we don't study it and dive into it so we can share it with folks. Listen, you've got the tradition. You know what I, I argue? The tradition, you know, that St. Paul says is necessary along with the written word of God. Amen. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, St. Paul says, Stand fast in the traditions you have been taught, either by word or by written epistle. Amen? The tradition that is essential for us, according to St. Paul. You know what it does? In a sense, among other things that tradition does. You know what it does? It puts us in the pet store. Amen? It gives you a context for sacred scripture. And you know what the magisterium does? The magisterium makes sure that we get it right on both of them. Both scripture and tradition. But think about this, alright? Put the kitty on the table, right? Think about this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. When Jesus said, call no man on this earth father. Magdala said to me, Tim, context, my friends. You believe that that means... Literally, you can call no man on this earth father. I said, amen. That's what Jesus said, right? He says, all right, let's go to Luke chapter 16, verse 24. 
I had never heard a Catholic quote. Folks, I thought there was a law somewhere against Catholic quoting the Bible. I thought it was canon law. Thou shalt not quote the Bible. Isn't that canon 666? <laughs> I've heard them all, folks. I've heard them all. Anyway, the point is, he's quoting the Bible. And what does Jesus call Abraham in Luke 16, verse 24? Father Abraham, right? He says to me, Tim, what's up with that? Is God confused? Now, folks, you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, i got to come back at this. You know, actually, before he even got to Luke 16, the first verse he quoted was Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, where Paul quotes the fourth commandment. You know the fourth commandment? Honor your father and mother. He actually, that was the first verse that Matt used on me. And, and you know, there it's honor your father and mother. And he says, you know, isn't your father someone on this earth? Well, I thought you said Jesus said don't call anyone on this earth father. Well, Paul does right here in Ephesians 6, right? My response to him was, well, that's a physical father. That's okay. You can call a physical father father. That's when he hit me with Luke 16, 24, where Jesus calls Abraham father Abraham. And then he asked me the question, Tim, would you say Abraham is a spiritual leader? You know what my response was? I didn't have a response. Why? Because I'm a Gentile. Amen? If you're a Gentile, that means Abraham is your spiritual father. Amen? So the point is here, Matthew began to take me through Scripture. He shows me Ephesians 6. He shows me Luke 16.24. And then he took me in my own Bible, ladies and gentlemen, Man, that made me so mad. He took me in my own Bible to Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 18. Seven times St. Paul calls Abraham, guess what? Father Abraham. He takes me to James chapter 2, verse 21. St. James calls Abraham, guess what? Father Abraham. He takes me to Acts chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, where St. Stephen preaches his famous sermon, right? How many deacons do we have in here? I know we got one, two, three. All right, holy deacons, listen up. St. Stephen, now this is the only sermon we know of from St. Stephen. You know what happened to him right after he preached it? They killed him! To my deacon friends, that's when you know you've really preached. <laughs> when they kill you, then you know you've really preached. <laughs> But how does Stephen start his sermon? He says, men, brethren, fathers, hearken unto me. 1 John chapter 2, verse 13. St. John, referring to the elders, most likely in Ephesus, to whom he was writing. It would later become sort of a universal letter. But the point is, he says, fathers to the elders. And he exhorts them to teach their spiritual sons and daughters. But you know what the ones that got me? The ones that, you know what, I had that, the light bulb moment. You know, if I was a cartoon character, the light bulb would go on and the little cloud above my head was 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15 and Ephesians 3, 14. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 14 and 15, St. Paul says, you have 10,000 instructors in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have not many fathers. I have become your father, for I have begotten you. Through the gospel. Did you catch that? St. Paul says he's your father. And the one that did me in was Ephesians 3.14. Now I'm going to quote from the Douay Reigns. Because I think it's closest to the Greek. But you know what it says? Giving thanks to the father. From whom all fatherhood. Or as the Douay Reigns says paternity. Coming from paternitas in the, in the Latin there. But it's from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth takes its name. Or the Douay just says, is named. But what did we learn about name? That means authority. Amen? Is, in other words, it's giving thanks to the Father from whom all fatherhood is derived. Derives its efficacy. And you know what he pointed out to me? Tim, Jesus could not have meant that you cannot enunciate the term pater. 
with reference to a human being, pater or father. Amen? Because if he did, then he contradicted himself. And Paul contradicted him. And John. And James. And Luke. Amen? And we know Scripture doesn't contradict itself. Amen? Amen. Can I say that again? Scripture doesn't contradict itself. Amen? Amen. No matter what some so-called scholar may have told you, it does not. All right, maybe we can get back to that too. Uh, Maybe in the Q&A. But here's the point. Matthew pointed out to me, Tyler, that in order to understand Matthew 23, 9, you've got to get in the pet store. Amen? You need to understand the tradition. You need to understand in context Remember, Jesus is speaking in the first century, in the, and we don't even have time to deal with the religious leaders that he was hammering in Matthew 23. Let's just talk about the political leaders. Jesus was speaking in the context of a culture where you had Caesar, and we know historically, in fact, archaeologically, we discovered a, an ancient Roman tablet which uh, revealed to us that the Caesars were demanding divine worship all the way back to Augustus. Did you know that? Augustus, 30 years before Jesus would make this statement. Now, some of the Caesars were a little bit more emphatic than others. Some of the Caesars said, if you don't acknowledge me as Father God, you're going to die. Do you know that many Catholics went to their death, the early Christians, not, not just for refusing to worship the pantheon of the gods, but for refusing to worship the emperor? Why? Because he demanded worship. And guess what he was called? Father. He was the father of the empire. The empire was his children. And they had to worship him and offer sacrifice to him. Can you see why Jesus said, call no man on this earth father? Are you all with me? What Jesus is saying is you cannot give to man or attribute to man that which is belongs to God alone by nature. True fatherhood, my friends. See, Caesar and religious leaders that Jesus was hammering were usurping the fatherhood of God. Jesus never condemned the participation in the fatherhood of God. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 3.14 when he says, giving thanks to the Father from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is derived. I am a father to my three poop machines at home (laughs) and my little crumb snatcher right now in my wife's belly. I am a father in as much as I participate in the fatherhood of God through a sacrament called holy matrimony. Amen? Amen? Father sitting right there is a father in the truest sense Inasmuch as he participates in the Father of God through another sacrament called Holy Orders. And he gives birth, if you will, through baptism to untold numbers of children over his priestly life. And he nurtures them and teaches them as a father his children. And we're them. Amen? That's not usurping the fatherhood of God. That's participating in the fatherhood of God. Now I'm going to tell you, folks. When I learned this all those years ago, I said, my goodness, here is a mat- an issue where I thought Catholics were so crazy, and yet I found out, man, I was wrong. There's nothing wrong with calling priests father or calling ministers father. I was wrong. And unfortunately, we're out of time right now, but we'll do some questions and answers. But you know what I found? Whether it's the Eucharist or it's justification, salvation, confession, you name it. I found one by one. This is what I'm talking about, folks. It was the little foxes that were spoiling the vine for me. But my friend Sergeant Matt Dula, many years ago in the United States Marine Corps, sat down with me. And we went over them doctrine by doctrine. We banged heads. We were throwing scripture verses at each other. Man, like grenades. Now, I'm not recommending this. (laughs) There were times when Matt Dula and I almost came to blows. And of course, in the name of Jesus. That's it, man. One more time about the Blessed Mother. We're going down. You know? Now, I'm not recommending that. Please, you know, don't leave here and say, Tim told us to go beat up Baptists. He's crazy. No, but what I am saying is this. We need to sit down 
And let's talk about it, folks, as brothers and sisters in Christ and those who are not Christians. Let's sit down. Let's reason together. And Catholics, my Catholic friends, don't keep this faith of yours a secret anymore. Get up. Get out of here when you go and go tell somebody about it. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Now, if, if y'all could, I'd like to keep the focus of the questions in this session on the topic of this talk. We, we want to try to keep it to questions concerning uh, Protestant or quasi-Christian sects of various, you know, be they Mormon Jehovah's Witnesses or the Baptist, Pentecostal, Lutheran, that sort of thing, if we could. Is that all right? Because we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'd like to keep them kind of focused in that area. Yes, ma'am. My name is Baptist, and we've been having just an ongoing conversation about the differences between the Baptist faith and the Catholic faith. And she, I didn't realize this, but the Baptists don't believe in baptism. They believe it in a confession of sins. And then after she was explaining this to me, she said something about the Bema Seat. And I said, what's the Bema Seat? And she said, you never heard of the Bema Seat? And I said, honey, really, what's the Bema Seat? Because I thought I heard it all. Yeah. Could you please explain to me what is the Bema Seat? Okay, first of all, uh, Baptists do believe in baptism, but they don't believe in baptismal regeneration, as you and I do. No, it's kind of funny. You're right, because we were Baptists, and yet we didn't believe baptism was necessary for, for salvation. Um, and this comes from, it's kind of the logical conclusion of justification by faith alone. It's actually led to some sects like the Salvation Army and other Puritan-derived uh, de sects who don't even baptize at all and don't do the Eucharist at all. Uh, they don't even have a communion service or anything. And, and it, you know, it stands to reason because if it's a pure symbol, it's not necessary for salvation, well, why do it? And it's kind of interesting. But the, the Baptists do baptize. They just don't believe that it's necessary for your salvation. Of course, we do. Why? Because the Bible says so. You know, it, it, it is amazing when folks will say, well, baptism doesn't save you. You say, really? Well, 1 Peter 3.21, you know what St. Peter says? Baptism now saves us. Does that sound like baptism saves us? <laughs> Amen. You know, and it, it's really amazing that, it, you know, this gets at something we said earlier. You see, you, you're raised in a certain environment and you see scripture with the lens that your pastor gives you. You know, how many times does the Bible say, for example, in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, St. Paul or St. Peter, when he preaches that first message on Pentecost, about Christ and demonstrating that he is the fulfillment of the prophecies. You know, he quotes Psalm 16 and other texts and Jesus is the fulfillment, right? And the people say, all right, what must we do? And what does Peter say? Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What does Ananias say to Paul in Acts chapter 22, verse 16? When God sends Ananias, Ananias to Paul, who had been, you know, get struck blind, right, for, for three days. <laughs> you know, I know we don't, we believe in free will, but how free was Paul? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. <laughs> no, he was free, and we have to say that, but my goodness, to get blinded, knocked off your horse. <laughs> Woo. Anyway, the point is, uh, Ananias says to him, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 3, you know what St. Paul says? We are buried together with him through baptism, so that as Christ is raised in newness of life, we may walk in newness of life. I mean, I could multiply the verses, and of course, John 3, verses 3 through 5, the born-again text that the church has infallibly interpreted as baptism. But here's, here's the point. When you get to that, now I'm sorry, I, I had to answer that baptism question because you got me started. I know your question was about the Bema seat. Bema is actually not the best, it's actually not how it's pronounced. It, the word is actually Bema because it's, it's in Greek, it's, it's Beta Epsilon Mu Alpha, which 
is actually bema. And it's, it simply means judgment. It's the judgment seat. And you find the word bema in, for example, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, when Paul says we were all, all of us as Christians, we will all uh, gather at the bema seat of Christ where we will receive either good or evil in accordance with the works that we've done in the body. That's what Paul says. So that's where that comes from. It merely means judgment. It's the judgment seat of Christ. Does that help? No, only one. All right, and this is what you want to do, okay? For those who say there's two judgment seats, one for Christians and one for everybody else, take them to Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And there, the scripture says, the Lord will come with all of his holy angels and he will gather all of humanity from the four corners of the earth and all will be gathered before him like a sheep before a shepherd. Now, notice, he, he's using sheep and goats as a metaphor. All right? He will gather us as a sheep, or as sheep and goats are gathered by the shepherd. But there's one judgment. He's the judge, and he separates the sheep and goats. And he says to the sheep on his right hand, Blessed are you of my Father into the kingdom. And you know what I love about that text, if, if you notice? Have you ever noticed how all of them are Catholic? <laughs> you know why I say that? They're all Catholic. You know why? Well, number one, as soon as you die, whether you're going to hell or heaven, you're all going to be Catholic because you're all going to know the truth. All right. But the point is, they're they're all. The point is that they're all Catholic, and the reason why I say that is because none of them knew where they were going. <laughs> Did you ever notice that? Because the ones he says are going to heaven, they say, Lord, why? Why are we going to heaven, right? And he tells them, because you did what? And he gives us the five out of the six corporal works of mercy. And then, or, or six of the seven, is that right? Yeah. He gives us all but one, bearing the dead is the only one that's not there, depending upon how you number them. Because some people number the, the feeding and the drink as one. The catechism lists those two as one. And in older catechisms, you'll find there too. But at any rate, the point is, none of them know where they're going. They all say, why? The ones that are going to hell, they say, why? And the ones going to heaven say, why? And he explains. And the point is, it's one judgment. And the only thing that separates the sheep and the goats is what they did and did not do. Doesn't that sound Catholic? But there is nothing in the Bible about two judgments, a believer's judgment and a non-believer. Simply doesn't exist. What you have in the Bible is a particular judgment and a final judgment. So there are two judgments. The particular judgment is indicated in many places. For example, in Hebrews 9.27, the Bible says it's appointed for each man once to die and then the judgment. The indication there is each. There is a singular judgment at the point of death. And this is indicated as well in Jesus, in Luke chapter 16, when he teaches about Lazarus and the rich man. Remember? When they die, there's presupposed an individual judgment because one goes to, to paradise and the other goes to a place of torment. So there is a particular judgment at each person's death. But then there is a final judgment at the end of time. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 25. At the end of time, we'll all be judged. And some people ask the question, well, why do you have two judgments? Why is there a particular judgment and a final judgment? Well, if you think about it, it's common sense. Because when we die as an individual, let's say I drop dead right now. I go to judgment. And I hope to God I make it. Uh, at least the purgatory, Lord. <laughs> right? And let's say, I make, well, at that point, I cannot and I would not be able to see, barring a special revelation, but there's nothing indicated that we will have that special re revelation be, because we know that the saints in heaven are praying for us right now. Amen? They don't know the outcome unless God specially reveals to them of everything. They're praying for us. Amen? So, so the point is, when I die, I am not going to be able to see all of the results of my actions, both good and evil. 
You know, I shared the faith with somebody on the airplane, and later they became Catholic, and I never knew about it. And then their whole family. I have a little part to play in that. And then their children, and their children's children, and so forth. I have a part to play. We're going to be able to see, as St. Thomas Aquinas said, we will be able to see how our actions and all of our actions have interwoven in, at, down to the minute detail. Isn't that cool? But that can't be known at the time of the particular judgment. At the final judgment, that's when everything is brought into light and we see the whole orchestration of God. We see Romans 8, 28. Man, this, this ought to make you want to get to heaven if nothing else. I mean, we love God, we love Jesus, and we want to be with Him. But you know what? You'll be able to know. And ladies, if you're here and you lost a baby, you lost a two-day-old baby that suffered and gasped for his or her last breath, you are going to know why. You will know why. You will know the entire plan of God and how that fit into God's plan. You will see Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. Man, I can't wait to get there, and I'm going to do everything I can to get there. All right? So that's the difference, basically, between the, the you know, and, and, you know, there's also the resurrection of the body and the, the fittingness of us being judged in the body because we acted in the body. You don't get judged in the body immediately, but you will at the end of time, and there's more things, but that's the problem with us. Uh, Okay, let's, if you have a question, come right on up here. Be bold and come up to the microphone. Yes? Okay, I have a question. No, oh, it's not wrong. Uh-oh. Why, didn't, no, why did Jesus say, call no man father instead of call no man God? Right. Well, that, that's something you can ask Jesus. <laughs> you know, I can't, there's a whole lot of things I would ask Jesus why he said this or that. Uh, you know, for example, in the gospel reading today, that was a tough one. And I thought Father handled it really well, by the way. But the question, why did Jesus say, call no man Father? I think, you know, even though I don't want to presume to tell Jesus what he should have said or shouldn't have said, but I think the reason is evident in as much as that's what people were dealing with at that time. They were dealing with people who were called, namely Caesar, who was calling himself Father. And Father God. And you also had religious leaders who were claiming prerogatives that belong to God alone. And so Jesus was saying, call no man father, meaning you don't give to men that which is due God alone. But see, if you take that in a strict literal sense, you end up having Jesus contradicting himself. Because he calls Abraham Father Abraham. And one thing we don't want to say is Jesus was a hypocrite. We can follow Jesus with confidence, knowing that he knew what he meant. Amen? And we can follow scripture when it refers to, to human beings as father. And so what you want to do is fit these verses of scripture together. Let me, let me toss out another point here. Because in that same context of Matthew 23, 9, Jesus also said in Matthew 23, verse 8, he said, call no man teacher. Did you know that? You have one teacher, even Christ. Now the Greek word there is didaskalos. Do you know there are men called teacher all over the New Testament? In James chapter 3 verse 1, James says, Let not many of you seek to be teachers, knowing you will receive the greater judgment. Did you know that Ephesians 4.11 says teacher is one of the offices in the church? All right? He says, God has placed in the church apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the building of the body of Christ. And really, you bring out a very important point. Because what you don't want to do in your biblical theology is end up having Jesus contradict himself all over the place. Right? Trust me, as an, as an apologist, I deal not only with Christians, I deal with atheists who comb over the Bible and try to find contradictions. I deal with them all the time. I love talking to those people. It is so much fun because you learn so much because you have to dig deeper and, and get answers. And there, there are some few verses of Scripture where we don't have answers. There are some things that, that maybe because of bad manuscripts, a few, there's not very many, 
like that. But, but uh, for the most part, you can show people that, look, even though Jesus said, call the man teacher, he calls people teacher. He's called teacher. Paul calls teacher. James calls teacher. So you understand that Jesus will often say, and script, sacred scripture will often attribute the things to God in an absolute sense, and then attribute them in a, particip a participatory sense to, to Christians. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, the Bible says, Jesus Christ is the shepherd and the bishop of the faith. I used the definite article there, ton, or tone, which means the shepherd and the bishop. Have you ever noticed how it also says Jesus is our one high priest? In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. And in fact, in Hebrews 7, 22, it says Jesus is our one priest. And yet, folks, think about it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 9 says we're all priests. Did you know that? By virtue of your baptism, you are a priest. That means you're a member of the universal priesthood, not the ministerial priesthood. That's reserved for guys like Father. But the universal priesthood, we're all members of. So you follow me? If you're going to take in a literal sense, Jesus is our one priest in Hebrews 7.22, then why, why does St. Peter call us all priests? And it's because, and, and if Jesus is our one shepherd, he's our one bishop, amen? I am the good shepherd. We also see same Greek word, poimena, is used there in John 10, that is used there in 1 Peter 2, 25. Well, folks, we got lots of shepherds. According to Ephesians 4, 11, remember I mentioned apostles, prophets, pastors. The word pastor in Greek is poimena. Amen? So, you know, Jesus makes Peter the shepherd. He uses the same Greek word there in John, in John 21, verse 15 through 17. Remember after the resurrection? When he says to Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? He then says, feed my lambs, baske, feed my arnia, lambs, the little ones. Then he says, shepherd my sheep. Shepherd, guess what it is? Poimain, it's a verb form, but it's poimain, shepherd my sheep. It's probata, that's the big sheep. And then he says again, feed my sheep. So in other words, Jesus communicates to Peter his authority, even though Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He is the one shepherd, amen? And Peter himself will say in 1 Peter 2.25, Jesus Christ is the shepherd and the bishop of our faith. He's the one shepherd, the one bishop. What do we see here? He makes Peter the shepherd. How is Jesus confused? No. He's making Peter his under-shepherd, who is the shepherd over all other shepherds, over all sheep. He is the one shepherd over the people of God in fulfillment of the prophecy of John 10, 16. When, he, when St. Paul gives the criterion for bishops in 1 Timothy 3, 1, is he contradicting Jesus when the Bible says he's our one bishop? No, because they participate in that one bishopric of Jesus Christ. Does that help at all? All right, you got an earful there, didn't you? She said, I got more than I bargained for. Yes, ma'am. If you can speak into that microphone so everybody... Oh, bummer. Yes. It's a judgment. He's going to judge me. Yes. Where do I go between then and heaven? There you go. Her question is, where do you go between the particular judgment and the final judgment? Well, there's only three options. <laughs> if, if, now, limbo is, is out of the question, even if you, you know, as many of you know, the church has recently uh, sort of reduced limbo from the level of common doctrine to now an acceptable theological opinion. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but the church has uh, reduced it. But that, even if, you know, that's a whole other question, but the point is that only applies to people who have never reached the age of accountability, even if it is true. So you're quite, for you, if you're over the age of seven, <laughs> are you over at seven? Okay, I just wanted to be sure. Uh, the only options are heaven or hell, ultimately. Purgatory is a pit stop on the way to heaven. Amen? 
for, for the final cleanup. So you're either going at the, at the particular judgment ultimately to heaven or hell. Ultimately, it's one of two places, but purgatory being the pit stop on the, on the way. Now, at the final judgment, basically, if you've already been judged particularly, unless you, you're one of the, in 2 Thessalonians 4.16, those who are alive and remain, they get judged immediately. And some ask the question, well, what if they need some purgatory cleanup? Well, God can intensify. We, we have to remember that purgatory is not necessarily... You know, there's some sense in which people move, or the souls move from potency to act, or they move from impurity to purity, or they move from having stains to not having stains and and such. They do away with temporal punishment. They go from having temporal punishment due to not. So there is some sense of motion. But time does not apply as you and I understand time. Time does not apply. And so the sufferings of purgatory can not only be you know understood in the sense of you're there for a period of time but it's more the intensity because of the fact that you will know that you're saved and yet you know there's this block keeping you from enjoying the fullness of the beauty of your vision because of the heightened sense of love that you'll have for god remember your will is directed toward god you know you're saved you're there and yet you know you can't get there because of this stuff that's holding you back the pain that will come from that. Remember, the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us that the pains of hell and purgatory are not to be seen, and by the way, it says must not be seen as external punishments inflicted by God. Right? And I know there, there's a lot of that among some of the, even the, some of the fathers of the church, you know, the sort of external. But it's really understood, you know, there's a development of our understanding of this, that it really comes from the nature of sin. It comes from the inside out. And so the pains of purgatory are rooted in the depth of your knowledge of God and knowing you can't get there. You know how the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 18 in in the Bible, it says, He that increases in knowledge increases in pain. And the one who increases in wisdom increases in suffering. Now why? It's kind of a paradox, isn't it? Because the more you know Praise God, you want to know. But the more you know, the more you suffer. Think of Our Lady of Sorrows at the foot of the cross. The reason why Mary suffered more than all the martyrs combined, she wasn't martyred, amen? Why do we call her Queen of Martyrs? Because she suffered more than all the martyrs combined. Why? Because it was her knowledge of her son that led to the pain. Amen? See, when you love moms, talk to me. Moms, when you love your baby like only a mom can. Nobody suffers like a mom who watches that baby die at a week old in a hospital room. Nobody suffers. Not even dad can suffer like mom. Why? It's because of the connection. It's because of the love. That's purgatory. It's because of the love that we have. We will be on our way to heaven. We know him in such a rich and deep way and yet we'll see we'll be able to see what's blocking us and keeping us from God and the agony that will produce. See, it's the intensity of the agony and the intensity of the revelation that God gives us that will add to the agony. But of course, he only gives us what we can handle. Are you all with me? See, it's a, So you don't want to get hung up on time so much when it comes to purgatory.